And now, Teresa Esser, Managing Director of Silicon Pastures, will introduce our speaker. Thanks, Steve. I'm standing here today because I am the chair of a special committee of the Rotary Club of Milwaukee. The name of this committee is Invest in Milwaukee. Our committee was formed to address a single question. How can we direct the resources of the Rotary Club of Milwaukee at the level of new and emerging businesses in our city, our state, and our region? When we started this committee a little over a year ago, we told everyone we were going to have a specific time-bound achievable goal. We were going to have meetings and we were going to prepare a report. Before the end of the year, we were gonna finish our report and I'm happy to, to announce that we achieved our goal. We had a series of meetings. We discussed our question in detail. We wrote a report. It's a great report, but we haven't released our report because it doesn't yet have a strong conclusion. We have not yet come up with a focused solution that will work for us here in Milwaukee. So during 2020, our goal is to create a plan. Last night, a very special person came to town. His name is John Austin, and he is a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Last night, we put on a very special dinner for John and for some members of the committee. We rented out a special room and we opened a couple bottles of wine. We ate a meal in front of a fire. Like Beowulf of old, the conquering hero came and told us his tales. We listened and we talked. We told our own stories. We talked about how we had each tried to do our various things to make Milwaukee a better place. We talked about how we had each tried to do battle in our own way against the monsters of poverty, unemployment, frustration, and hopelessness. The fire crackled and we listened to our guest. We listened to stories about things that had happened in lands that were far away. We learned about the epic battles that had been fought in the state of Michigan, in the state of Ohio, and in the state of Pennsylvania. We learned that the state of Michigan has done some battles against the same monsters that affect us, poverty, unemployment, frustration, and hopelessness, and they have won these battles. Today, John Austin is here to tell us these stories so that you all, everyone in this room, can be included in the circle. Listen to these stories, be inspired. Please listen to what John Austin has to say. Well, thank you, Teresa. And thank you for others of you who made my visit here possible. You know, as, as wonderful as it is, and as excited as I am to be meeting so many of you who are coming saying how excited you are to hear me talk, and now Teresa saying how special I am and conquering hero. There's nothing, while that is certainly putting a lot of pressure on me, it is certainly wonderful to be wanted. Uh, it's a different experience than I had just earlier this morning when I spoke at the Community Innovation Summit that's going up on down the street at Northwestern Mutual. I was giving a different version of this talk and I happened to get up and be introduced to the podium after John Ridley had been holding forth about the community and his experience, and half the crowd began to exit, and the seven TV cameras at the back packed up, and it's a little unnerving when you're being introduced and half the room is leaving and the cameras are packing up, so thank you for staying. I know that you're trapped, though, because you can't break the rotary rules, right? So uh, thank you again for, um, for giving me the opportunity to bring me back here to, to share with you. Um, some of you asked about Brookings and the Chicago Council, where I uh, have affiliations. Um, and so it's interesting. Um, it was some 15 years ago. I'd been focused mainly in Michigan and how we do good things to evolve our economy and what public policy and political leadership can do in Michigan. But I took some tri trips to Europe that were sponsored by the German Marshall Fund to see what the Europeans do in similar older industrial communities. And it really sparked 
this uh, understanding that, wow, we need to look at the broader geography, that we do have a shared history in the Midwest, the agro-industrial center of our, of our country and our economic power in the 20th century, and that we're all trying in Milwaukee and Cleveland and Detroit and Pittsburgh to leverage similar strengths, which I'll talk about, and treat unique deficits. And I began to kind of try to organize, do we have a plan for like turning around the, the Midwest and the Rust Belt? Uh, and among those who responded affirmatively to this idea that maybe we should do this was fellow Bruce Katz at Brookings, who is, um, runs the Metropolitan Policy Program. And this was in 2005 and he, six, and he was saying, you know, this is kind of crazy, but this is what Brookings should lend its influence to. These are the important swing states. These are the important kind of definers of a lot of our both politics and our economic future. And so he said, do you want to be a non-resident senior fellow and we'll raise money and we'll just go and start doing it. And I said, sure, you know. And so once he knighted me, it made me feel good because I could tell to my mother-in-law, you know, it sounds important. He must be doing something credible in life. So it gave me that opportunity. But also, um, at that time, we were working with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and other organizations in the region. Uh, I refocused after many years, look, worrying about this agenda that I'm going to show to you or part of it to you and went back to Michigan. But since 2016, I lost my elected position as president of the State Board of Education in what was a surprise. But what came back was now the whole world is interested in wither the Midwest. What is going on with the people and their attitudes and their opportunities in Wisconsin and Michigan? So we reanimated this focus on how can we accelerate economic growth and good things and spread it to more people and places in the Midwest. Uh, and the Chicago Council of Global Affairs was eager to step up and provide some leadership to that. I don't know if you know this, but Brookings was founded, um, it was the first think tank on the planet, founded after World War I, or, or, the, or we first passed a federal um, income tax. It was founded by a St. Louis businessman who thought the government's going to be bigger, they need some help running their books and figuring out how to run a bigger enterprise. That was the creation of the Brookings Institution. The Chicago Council on Global Affairs was formed after World War I and in the beginnings of the recession when there was by the Chicago leadership, um, who, when there was a time of kind of um, protectionism, retreat from the international order, anxiety about immigration, and it was purposely built by the business community to say, no, we need to learn about the world, be engaged about the world, have positive understandings and entanglements with the world, not fear the world. And so that outward-oriented positive agenda was their creation as well. So they were eager to step up. We're now at a moment where there is, again, some sense of pullback from the international community, disengagement, protectionism, nativism rearing its, its unfortunate head. So the Chicago Council and we have been working together and with Brookings to kind of paint and repaint an agenda for our region and our economy um, that is a place where it was the crucible of the great agro-industrial enterprises that grew and powered America in the 20th century. All the great industries from steel to aviation to autos to chemicals to the durable goods, the machine tools that powered and ran uh, and produced the products like here in Milwaukee were, were created and um, found their um, beginnings here and, and created vast opportunity and vast uh, wealth and people from around the country and the world flooded here to take these good jobs, participate in this for several generations and enjoy the kind of vital communities uh, and the dynamic leadership of these emerging industries that powered America's 20th century. Now, as we all know, globalization, new competitors, restructuring of the global marketplace, all this manufacturing and durable goods production all became under such stress and restructuring. And the region is in this transition from this agro-industrial powerhouse to and making kind of an uneven transition to find its purchase in a new era that is defined by knowledge work, talent, uh, high, higher levels of skill and ability demanded, and a technology-laced, technology-driven economy and communities. Now, we're saying, and this transition can be accelerated and spread. As I'll come to admit, many places in the Midwest, they're not Rust Belt. You know, Minneapolis a long time ago evolved from being the, the flour milling capital of the world to a more diverse and even tech uh, community. Um, other communities have also turned a corner, and we'll touch on that. 
But this region, part of our goal, we just released this updated report, The Vital Midwest, which tells the story about the two Midwests and how we can accelerate economic change and transition in those parts of the Midwest that aren't yet you know, sort of turned a corner and are, are thriving in a global knowledge economy. Um, so today, different from even 15 or 20 years ago, it's not a monolith of uh, struggling communities you know, that have lost their, their anchor employers. Um, yes, there are still some of those, uh, certainly Sharon, Pennsylvania in the old steel country. Now, I had a picture, this is Janesville, which like Flint is often used as an icon of losing their big anchor GM. But I was just with the um, economic development person from Janesville, and she was telling me, this picture is now changing. So I got to update this picture. It's evolving. Janesville has had some good stuff lately. So, but for every Sharon in Janesville, there is today, I mean, who'd have thunk Pittsburgh, you know, had the collapse of their signature industry, plummeting incomes, uh, leaving bodies, meaning the people, the talent that was generated at Carnegie Mellon and University of Pitt were getting out of there as fast as they could. They've completely turned the corner. Now people are coming there, young educators are coming there, and it's on the backs of the innovations and new ideas in AI and robotics and healthcare that are coming out largely of Carnegie Mellon and UPIT. Plus they spruced up this beautiful river city. So it's a thriving you know, renaissance for this you know, iconic steel city that totally collapsed 30, 40 years ago. You, places like Madison, or where I just was, or Ann Arbor. I mean, these places that are anchored by these great world-leading research universities. I mean, they're just killing it. Everybody wants to be there, including the Googles. You know, that's the Google office in Ann Arbor, because they want to be there. Because that's where the talent is, that's where the action is. Plus, it's got a really great quality of life. Uh, really great. My daughter just started law school out um, at Berkeley in California with her AI machine learning Salvadoran uh, husband who works in that crazy tech belt, you know, south of Market Street that some of you have seen. It's like, whoa, how did this thing grow? You always worry when they go to college or out in California, like you're going to lose them. Lydia starts texting me, wait, this place has issues. I just smell smoke. Then, hey, I was in an earthquake. Then it's like, oh my gosh, there are homeless people everywhere. And so it's like, I don't want to stay in California. Um, but. There are places and more of our places in our communities that can both provide the wonderful quality of life and be the centers of the tech and knowledge driven economy. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. And we do that by building on some of our amazing strengths that are uniquely powerful and are here. We still have, we have many globally engaged companies who play and produce and provide services in world markets. I didn't appreciate till Bill Testa of Chicago, it should be Chicago Federal Reserve, bank. He was like a Midwest economist. He said, you know, all of the business consultancies and business services firms, you know, the, the Andersons and the Price Waterhouses and all these companies that grew up in Chicago, they did because the bankers from New York wanted somebody to help watch and police and do the books for these giant manufacturing firms, the Alice Chalmers of the world that were growing out in the Midwest. So all the business services firms and consultancies, you know, grew here because of this great enterprise. And we, you know, we and you and many folks in the room play in a broader stage. Fortune 500 companies were created here. I often use like Procter & Gamble grew from, Cincinnati was on the Ohio River. It's where it was a break in the river where they stopped and they chopped up the pigs to make soap. And then it grew into this consumer products giant that plays globally. I mean, that is the story of the region repeated over and over. And we still have many of those players who are dynamically involved in, in global the global economy. We also were blessed with more and more powerful and larger network of universities, research universities, yes, colleges than any place on the planet. Which if you think about it, these are the re engines of the new economy. All the emerging sectors from IT to energy to, to tech uh, to healthcare all grow up and emerge out of the centers and interplay between the private sector and the great research universities which we have in abundance. Um, and that's, we have 20 plus of the top 200 global research universities, including, look at Wisconsin, what, number 43? You know, Michigan, where I live, is up there. And so these, these are the fulcrums for the knowledge economy. I mean, you think about it, it's sort of obvious. Uh, and so we have that asset, which has amazing innovation horsepower. So we disproportionately produce, this is the share of the Midwest Great Lakes region's production of intellectual property, R&D done in one. Uh, new patents, NIH 
research grants, we win in our universities. All of these things usually translate into new ideas, new technologies, new startups, new products. We also even more disproportionately produce the nation's talent. We, with our big universities and many, many colleges that were created purposely here because this region valued education, the people that settled it valued education, and we're the site of the first great public research and land-grant universities in the country, we always valued education. And we produce a disproportionate share of the nation's talent in all disciplines, from STEM to uh, engineers to MBAs, here. We're getting better at keeping them here, and the way you keep them here is by doing the work of tomorrow and being on the cutting edge of solving the problems of tomorrow uh, in innovative emerging sectors, because they don't want to work in the old economy. They want to work on solving tomorrow's problems and today's problems, like climate change, like providing uh, available food for people and social justice, and they want to be part of that work. So that's part of what we need to keep in mind as we say, how do we take advantage of this talent that is here? And that we generate here and make sure it stays here and goes to work here. But this is from 12 years ago. All of that innovation, all of that talent generation, which you know are the coin of the realm of today's economy, um, have not historically in recent generations translated into the new businesses and new startups locally that they by all rights would expect to. I mean, why do you think Silicon Valley exists? because of the federal labs and Stanford and Berkeley and all the stuff that spilled out of that. Why do you think Boston is a you know, new economy hothouse? It's the Harvards and the MITs and the research hospitals. You know, these things usually translate into that kind of hothouse dynamic. Now, 12 years ago, this, is a, this shows uh, 12 years ago kind of an index of the most entrepreneurial communities where blue is good, blue is very entrepreneurial. Uh, with a lot of churn, a lot of startups, sort of a startup culture. Red is bad. Um, and so we only had one big city, Minneapolis, in the region that was an entrepreneurial culture. And we had two, if you count the smaller cities, Rochester, Minnesota, with the Mayo Clinic being the second. Um, and so at the time, we posited and thought, you know, we, did, we looked hard at this. Brookings is, insists on rigor, so I couldn't, like, make this stuff up, and I got some help. But one reason for that is our, our companies, you know, we're, we're sort of responsible for our communities in many ways. And we got used to that. And people lost their kind of entrepreneurial zip. These big paternal employers that put people to work. I mean, I use the example, I've talked to people, several generations in the Detroit area. Why would you want to start a business and take a risk when you can work at Ford's? I mean, that's what it's called locally, Ford's, Ford Motor Company. I heard someone who was saying me, same deal with Donnelly's in Chicago. It's those paternal employers. I lived and worked in Flint trying to be helpful for a few years. There was no sense there that people could do something for themselves. And if GM, the UAW, and the Mott Foundation didn't do it for us, we don't know what to do. So that defines many of our communities. Um, the industrial structure, a lot of innovation, a lot of new patents, new technology, but tied up in these big employers. You know, I had a neighbor across the street, Fred, and I was, when I was first selling this picture, this is interesting, massive innovation, massive talent generation, doesn't get commercialized. And I was talking to this, his daughter was friends with my son Murphy. She's like, my dad had lots of patents. He's a GM engineer. And so I asked Fred about his patents and they're all in telematics and they're all, you know, the things that you're getting your computer to do in the car so that I can turn down the volume when teenagers are in the car. That's what they're working on now, like teen proof driving. But his patents don't start a new business or a new startup. They're tied up in GM and Delphi and these big firms. So that's another reason. Um, if we lose young educated people, that's, they're the most, they're among the most entrepreneurial. And if we don't get enough immigrants, immigrants are also wildly entrepreneurial then we're not having that entrepreneurial culture. And then, but finally, and the reason, and the reason I was invited to here to talk is we don't, capital and big capital doesn't find, and at any stage, these innovations and turn them into new businesses and, and startups locally. So I mean, we need more capital applied to grow new businesses at all stages, as Teresa and others will persuade you very easily. Certainly venture capital has a powerful role in kind of creating that explosive innovation dynamic. Um, less than 1% of investment 
capital is put into venture capital, but it's responsible for what, 20% plus of new revenues and the employment in the firms that explode. And they also explode and multiply millionaires who start new businesses. Uh, and that's how you create a different dynamic. It also creates a different story. You're on the front edge of what's coming. You're no longer old economy. I'll give an example that just happened. We don't have too many unicorn you know, um, IPOs in the Midwest. We just had one in Michigan a couple years ago. Duo Security, which is, you may be using it, it's that two-factor authorization when you want to enter your, so that's this company. I didn't know it until my wife said, oh yeah, there are um, some Asian smarty pants coming out of the University of Michigan, Doug Song and his partners. They created this cybersecurity technology. They created a new startup. They raised money only from coastal venture capital. That's a, a topic we'll get to. Um, and they grew this business. And now it's employing 800 or 1,000 people in Ann Arbor and Detroit, because they wanted to put people to work in Detroit. It had a $1.3 billion IPO. Then within a year, it's bought by Cisco, committing to keep it local, which is another problem sometimes. The big VCs, or when it's bought, they move it out of the Midwest because they want to babysit it or you know, want to take it. Committed to keep it low. So now all of a sudden, there are like 20, 30 more millionaires newly minted running around Southeast Michigan in the tech field. And they're all going to start new startups. And that's how you change. So we're struggling in Southeast Michigan as other places. How do we evolve from a, we're a one trick pony still, the auto industry. Now it's the, oh, we're going to lead the new mobility industry if Pittsburgh doesn't eat our lunch. Um, if we're seen as a tech place, and uh, you know, we're a leader in this tech industry, that begins to change, create a new narrative about the region. Just as, you know, applaud you all here, I was here a lot some years ago. Water, water technology, water wonderful location, water research, Milwaukee rebranding itself in part as an innovator in solving world's water problems. Yeah, that's what young people want to work on. That's about solving the problems of tomorrow. The world needs water solutions. That's a telling a different story about Milwaukee, which is very powerful. So again, when we first did this look through Brookings, this is one major strand of the agenda for economic transformation in the region. Uh, there are many others. We still have more adults already in the labor market with just a high school diploma who are already being put out of their occupations or disappearing. We need to educate them and upskill them. We have the most segregated communities in the, the country. We have these advantages like the beautiful Great Lakes and outdoors and in the time of climate change, like this is the one sustainable platform where people can grow and we grow businesses and population. But this issue of, look at these metrics, these are from 12 years ago. I went, oh, well, we, I'll show you the updated ones in a minute. Um, a third of the nation's IP research, one and done, 12% um, of the nation's venture capital spent here. Meanwhile, Almost half of the money from our pension funds, just taking one big institutional resource, half of the money from pension funds in the nation that are put into venture capital, are our, it's our money. I mean, we invented the pension funds here in Wisconsin and the Midwest and our employers. And uh, we invented the private pension fund, you know, the big industrialized industries, steel, autos. They invented, they wanted to give a benefit to keep their workers. They invented the private, we'll pay your pension the defined benefit pension, the public sector mimicked it. So half of the money, we're exporting our wealth, basically. And the wealth from here and the wealth from the coast is not finding our innovation and turning them into new businesses locally. Um, at that time, a few years ago, as Teresa kind of alluded to, some of the states did some things to try to change that vector. Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, all created kind of a state-backed innovation fund that would be a resource to make smart investments in their own venture capital funds uh, and co-invest in, in emerging startups to try to grow that ecosystem and grow the capital that's going through it. Uh, and it did work to grow the innovation ecosystem and to grow our VCs in Michigan so that we have more that can be a responsible investment for other institutional investors you know, Arboretum Ventures in Ann Arbor is a big, you know, they their fifth round, healthcare, biotech. And Jan Garfinkel is head of the National Venture Capital Association this year. She's like, yeah, we're one of the few places that the Kresge Foundation or the UAW Pension Fund can say, yes, I can invest in you when I'm investing in VC because it's a good investment. I'll get a good return. We don't have enough of those. Um, there are other, 
we were arguing for and still are, we need a regional fund or fund of funds that would be a credible vehicle to put more money to and through other smart local investors like you have here uh, to try to grow the capital. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's talent spotting too. People who locally know what's emerging from University of Wisconsin or here and can say, hey, we're investing in this. Teresa's investing in this. Come in coastal VCs, co-invest with us. We, we updated this analysis of the kind of innovation investment dynamics last year. All of this is available too online. And I can get it to you. Um, so today, what's different from 15 years ago, now everybody is obsessed with the region. And there is a lot more coasts are saturated. There is innovation in the heartland. Um, how can we make good investments? How can we find where to invest? Uh, people like Steve Case, you know, and others are running around, you know, with their own funds to rise of the rest, you know, that we're going to invest in some of these flyover country places and try to accelerate the economy there. But today, the, the numbers are even worse than the ones I just showed you. We have still have similar innovation metrics and talent generation metrics in the region. Um, the VC and other deals are getting bigger which makes it harder for our venture capitalists and others to play. But now look at this, 4.3% of the nation's venture capital is going into those Great Lakes states, while 51% is going into California still. A lot of that is our money and the money from the coasts that institutional investors think are responsible, fiduciary responsible investments, because they are. You're going you're gonna to get a good return with Kleiner Perkins. You can count on it. That money isn't finding its way back here. Oops. We still have university, we have some of the best endowed universities in the country, seven out of the top 25 in terms of money in the bank that they do invest in VC. Uh, and certainly our universities are innovation labs. I won't say they're all well-funded. States have been cutting back. You know, University of Texas in Austin is in part thriving because they have a special fund from their oil and gas revenues that's, they just pour in the top of the University of Texas. And so they can steal all the faculty from Michigan and Wisconsin. You know, that's, you know, it's not a very scientific secret to success. Grow these institutions of research and learning and good things will happen. We have them, but we don't, their, their resources aren't invested in our innovation. We took a, just a snapshot of, we have a lot of wealth. We have a lot of rich people. Some of them are in the room, you know, whose companies, whose family companies, who, who's, um, who started philanthropies. All of them invest money. Many of them invest money, a part of it, in venture capital. Uh, this is just looking at some of these foundations, philanthropy. Our, I mean, we invented philanthropy practically, the biggest foundations until just recently when the coastal people like you know, Bill Gates began to co-equal us, you know, are the Rockefellers and the Fords and the Kellogg Foundation, you know, the great endowments. But look at these, 71 investments in venture capital, only one in our region, from regional philanthropies. Here's another problem. Even when we're based here, like the duo security, that has you know, this $2.3 billion buyout from Cisco, again, minting you know, 20 more millionaires who are gonna create that explosive new story growth dynamic in cybersecurity and tech, uh, they, couldn't, they didn't get any money from the region. It was not our money that was backing them. And that's the same in other Midwest states. So, we just don't, as the capital and VC game, and capital is needed at all stages, gets bigger, the region, we don't have enough, this is so the relative, how many big venture capitals uh, firms exist in California, Massachusetts, New York, Great Lakes, and how many you know, medium-sized, you can see, we, we, we don't have very many big ones, and we don't have very many medium-sized ones. Uh, so we need to grow that nexus uh, so that there are good investments where people can make money, because that's what it's all about. You invest well to make money, you know, you back 10 firms in a VC, one hits, but you, it has to be somebody that knows what they're doing and can handle people's money responsibly and get good returns. We need more of those people, we need more wealth going through that pipeline. So today, more states, and again, sometimes these state funds or innovation funds are on again, off again, because the political leadership changed, like, you know, we had a Michigan fund that was kind of working, then the next governor comes in, takes it away. But some of our states, Illinois just upped their treasury investments in VC to put it through um, local VCs in Illinois so that 
their companies don't leave Illinois. Um, Ohio and Michigan, or Indiana just created a 300 plus million dollar innovation fund to do the same thing in Indiana. And they've done a lot of smart things right in Indiana, particularly in Indianapolis, to try to fuel the growth of their tech economy. And when I was out here speaking at, in Madison with the administration and some of the investor community that you were, all were there, I was saying, I don't know enough about what you've got, but the musing there was, look, we have, we have a Badger fund, it's relatively small, uh, could we be doing some bigger things and how to do it well that could take more of our wealth, more of our institutional investors, and help them steer through some Wisconsin-focused innovation support activity and investment-making nexus? And I think you all are trying to figure that out. What is Milwaukee doing? Um, you know, Southeast Michigan, one of the slides I didn't mention, you know, the, our former governor and others, they, cr they created a private sector-backed um, renaissance fund whose mission was really, let's grow the ecosystem and businesses in Southeast Michigan. But to do it well, they gathered resources from you know, family offices, institutional investors, and companies. But they invest around the Midwest. That's another lesson. So they invest in around the Midwest, but they also end up investing in local firms as well, local startups. So it's accomplishing its mission. And part of how you do it is you invest more broadly and have a diversified portfolio. So you know Milwaukee, I don't know what you're doing here, but you can do things like that, and even the private sector can lead it. You don't need to you know, wait for dysfunctional government or you know, good or bad or indifferent political leadership. So, and when you do it, I mean, you're doing so many things right here. Um, when you put our innovation smarts to work and you fund the work of tomorrow and you grow the emerging sectors and the firms that are in the businesses of tomorrow, and you add that with all these other resources that matter in a changed economy. People want to live and work and play in places with great quality of life, where you can walk, where there's history, where there's arts and culture and music, and you can reach the lake, and it's not toxic, and you can walk along it or see it out of your office window. You know, that's amazing. And that's how you can, again, agglomerate the talent and the activity that begins to get that virtuous flywheel going. And I, Milwaukee has that flywheel going, for sure. Grand Rapids is another community that's sort of similar, it's a little smaller, but you know, it's West Michigan, conservative, stodgy, um, furniture and auto parts. It had the biggest collapse in the Great Recession of any mid-sized city in terms of lost manufacturing jobs. But they have civic and business leadership that just do a lot of things right. And they have worked and ran a plan, uh, everything from let's set a goal to be the greenest, most sustainable mid-sized city putting targets on reducing our energy use, water use, getting people out of cars and onto public transportation too so they can uh, get to jobs. Their lead employer is amazing. You know, Steelcase, Herman Miller. Um, we're gonna wring our supply chains out of energy use and, and be the most efficient. Uh, Cascade Engineering, great example of how this works. Big auto parts maker, plastic injection molded auto parts. If you look, have you looked under the hood of your car lately? It's plastic parts. That's what they do, 5,000, 7,000 employees. Their CEO, Fred Keller, is you know, a visionary. He's like, auto parts is going to be a diminished part of our business. Started them getting into green products. We're gonna make disposable products. There's a market for that. We're gonna make solar panel holders for roofs. Now they make this plastic thing that with local ingredients in the developing world, you can filter water and make it safe to drink. When 60% of People in the developing world are in hospital because of waterborne pathogens. They're solving a global health problem from competencies that made them us great in the auto industry. The young people, the engineers and the environmental scientists at you know, Grand Valley State University, which they also moved back into downtown Grand Rapids to redevelop along the river, which they cleaned up and put arts and culture institutions. The young people like tripping over themselves to work at Cascade. I want to be part of that. I didn't think I could do it in Grand Rapids. I wanted to go to Chicago, but now I find it. That's how you keep your talent that wants to work on solving the big problems of today and tomorrow. They build a medical mile research complexes out of nothing. You know, they had much less to work with and now it's a burgeoning health medical industrial complex in Grand Rapids. So they, it's an example of what you can do when you get organized and you kind of run a plan to lean into the future and not bemoan the, the, the past. There are other communities that we feature in the report in different ways. You know, Pittsburgh I talked about where they, they lost their anchor employers. Um, Akron, Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo lost first the paper mills, 
which polluted the river. Then Upjohn and Pfizer, 40,000 jobs. That was their, gone. What did they do? They kept some of the bio talent that spilled out of them, helped them start new businesses and biotech firms. They had Stryker already, which is in a growing business. They remade their downtown with you know, walkable, livable, brew pubs, nice urban fabric. Has anyone had any Bell's beer or Two Hearted or Oberon? I mean, it's like the best beer, so. But most importantly, they, they did something. They, I, I'm partial, that's my home team. They created the Kalamazoo Promise, which said, we are going to mark ourselves as a community that values higher education for economic development reasons. Anybody that goes to Kalamazoo schools is going to have a free university education anywhere in Michigan paid for. Private donors did set this up. What did it do? It marked Kalamazoo as a place that values higher education. Employers come in, more people get an education, but also reverse the exodus of working and middle class families out of Kalamazoo. And they're now back and they're, they're moving in and property values are going up. It's revived the community. So they're high incomes today. So it can be done even in places that don't have a major research university or aren't a major metro like Columbus or another one that's, you know, has to, or Milwaukee that's turned a corner basically. So my exhortation to you is to listen to this guy, Ned Gramlich. Um, he's now deceased, but former Federal Reserve Board Governor appointed by Clinton, University of Michigan Provost. He was one of my um, critiquers of the original vital center that we published, uh, and he pronounced it good. And since Larry Summers, at the time, we were trying to get the feds and others to do more for our region, Larry Summers was Obama's economic advisor. Um, Larry is very full, and then Harvard University president, until they ran him out. He's very full of himself. He's the smartest guy on earth. But this is a guy he listens to, because he's his mentor as an economist. So I said, Ned, I need you to come to this conference at Brookings to talk about the future of our region. He said, I can't. He was dying of leukemia. I said, Couldn't, give me a sound bite. This is his sound bite of the future of our region. We know the past. And it's still the most succinct summary of the opportunity we have. We can be, we got the horsepower to be the center of innovation in all that's coming. And we can be this beautiful, clean, green, blue, I say, to playground for our own people and to draw people here again. So that's the work before us. It's an optimistic vision, and I think it's true. And I really applaud Milwaukee and you all as leaders for have, helping this place turn the corner. But there's more things you can do to kind of spur it further by putting more capital, putting it in the right place, and, and helping that to happen. So sorry I ran over a little bit, but thank you very much for the opportunity. to. I hope I didn't dis disappoint you, Teresa. With all that um, buildup, man. Questions, other speeches, or alternative worldviews? Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the IP patents and the universities that hold those patents and maybe some mention of how that helps or doesn't help the innovation in our region, in our state? The question was talk about the IP coming out of the universities and the innovation and how that helps or sometimes does not contribute to the innovation. I'm repeating because I was told to, because I think it's recording, so it's not that I can't hear you. Um, so I think one, one truth is some universities have regimes that just make it a lot easier and create kind of reward system for their faculty and others to, to help their ideas get commercialized. Others don't do it very much at all. So MIT and Stanford, you know, that's what they do. They, their researchers and faculty are part of their reward structure is also, yeah, are you growing new businesses out of what you just did? Um, Wharf, I understand, at University of Michigan or Wisconsin is, is good, but not every piece of that institution, nor certainly my home institution, University of Michigan, is organized similarly to accelerate the rewards for pulling these ideas out of where they come from. And they're, they're, they're common. I mean, I was just over at University of Michigan looking at these computer scientists who are working on water infrastructure. They're doing IT lace sensors that are now going into wastewater systems around the country that basically allow you to manage what we got without having to rebuild the infrastructure and prevent overflows. Like that's pretty cool, saving money by just, you know, IT information that can help you manage the flows. And it's like, this is a business, somebody, you know, but it's, they're, they're open sourcing it, which is great. But you know, helping those things turn into the new, you know, the new Amazon or the new um, 
uh, whatever, pick your, you know, Twitter, what have you. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Um, and this this problem of um, how you scale, as you said, the innovation that is extant in the Midwest, you know, is mind blowing, and it really is relevant because you saw the kind of metrics. One of the challenges, it is dispersed. You know, it's not all in you know Boston. It's not all in one metro community. You've got a lot going on. You know, in in Ann Arbor, you got a lot going on in Madison. There's a lot going on in Iowa City. It's hard to you know scale it when it's dispersed. One way or a couple ways that we, people have been trying to do it, John Nice here of Venture Investors, I don't know if John, some of you know John, he was trying to go around and talk all the Big Ten institutions, basically, you know, in your self-interest, can't we do something with your endowments and put more of it into, you know, the innovation that's coming out of your universities? It would help you, you know, commercialize more of this stuff, put it into, you know, VCs and, and invest it in that kind of innovation. Couldn't persuade them to get together on anything, you know, because we don't, play well together. Um, that's the idea behind a regional fund. I said the Renaissance, part, Renaissance Ventures in Detroit is operating as a quasi Midwest regional fund. It's a private sector led. We think a, a regional fund or fund of funds would be a vehicle. But yeah, some of the states are doing it differently better. You know, for example, what Illinois just announced putting $800 million of money the treasury invests every year in something, right? Putting 800 million of that into venture capital in Illinois you know, that, that's real money. We used to securitize tobacco, tobacco settlement money in um, Michigan for some years to make this 21st century innovation fund. So we're putting, you know, 400, 500 million dollars in a fund that grows Jan Garfinkel's Arboretum Venture VC into a larger successful VC. You know, so putting more money and putting some real money into these innovation funds. Uh, but there are also, you can put restrictions on it that make it, you know, not work. You can, you know, we only have got to invest in our state. You can, you can put restrictions on location of partners that you invest in. They'll, it, the come and go, the come and go nature of some of these state-backed efforts. You know, political leadership changes, political winds change. You know, the, investing is a long-term game, right? So if your governor is going to take away the innovation support system because it doesn't like the old governor, you know, that's basically what they do. Oh, I don't like that stuff that they did. I'm doing something else. Ironically, Rick Snyder, our recent governor, took away the stuff that was working under Jennifer Granholm, even though he was allegedly a venture capitalist, you know, when he came back to Michigan, because he wanted his own, it was just business climate and economic gardening. We don't believe you can seed this, some of this stuff. So I'd be happy to share more about what we think we've learned, and some of it is in the reports, which, you know, Google Brookings, venture capital, John Austin, and you'll get more than you ever want to read. Um, uh, and more generally than you ever want to read. Though they are policy page turners, you know, if you can believe it. I mean, they really are. Or at least I tell myself then. Other questions? I think we've got time for a couple more. Yes? As a follow-up to that point and your anecdotal story about your daughter in California, they're facing societal challenges. To what extent will that money potentially be diverted from the likes of California to the Midwest? Um, you know, and again, I, in, in this vital Midwest report, which again, I encourage you if you want a long policy page turner to read, because it's about our current moment and what we could do to accelerate change. We do note that, yeah, the cost of living is 20% less in our communities, many of which have an economic dynamism that rivals, you know, think Madison or Ann Arbor, or even where you're getting in Milwaukee, that rivals the coastal communities, but with much nicer people and you know, more kind of authentic values that you know, people appreciate and would like for their families, hard work, you know, being, uh, being friendly. I'm serious. <laughs> and I, I mean, I, what freaked my daughter out, and they have a huge homeless problem in California, so it's not funny, but it's like, oh my God, I didn't tell you about that text, there's poop on the sidewalk, like everywhere, you gotta watch it. So you know, we don't have those same challenges here, we've got other challenges, but I think 
that's not the main driver of, of what is going to, you know, help us. Just we're cost of living and we're friendlier and we're more wholesome, you know, and we have cute historic communities that are, you know, nice. I think what's going to do is, are we serious about doing the work of tomorrow in all the emerging fields where there's global work to be done that we have the ability to do? Are we, are we serious about doing that work and not trying to prop up the past? Um, and then the capital on the coast does want to find us. We have to give them a window to let them in. You know, they have to have a network of smart investors who can help them make money. And that's why if you seed and grow the smart investment and investor community here, they'll have partners because it's, you know, everybody knows each other, right? They'll have people, oh yeah, I can, I'm going to invest. Jan Garfinkel, I'll just pick on, you know, or, or favor my home team. She knows what she's doing. Uh, coastal investors, we're coming because there's, there's lots of biotech, new medical stuff to invest in that she's spotting for me, right? So we need, that's why we need to grow the family and fabric. And many of you in the room may be doing this of money and people who are in this business locally, because that will allow, the coasts are saturated with money and they're, as someone said last night at dinner, they're investing in all sorts of wacky things, you know? We actually invest here a little more seriously in things that are translatable into like real products that people can touch or feel or real new services that are, are useful for humanity. Um, just as we always did when we put the world on wheels and we taught the world to feed itself and other important things, you know, that were part of our creation story. I'm getting the hook, it looks like. <laughs> You're lucky. Those of you who were made to stay, thank you. It made me feel good. Thank you. Thank you, John. Rotary has been a uh, <clears throat> world leader in the eradication of polio. <clears throat> So in honor of your program today, we're going to make a donation to the Rotary Foundation to purchase 50 doses more of the vaccine to uh, bring us that much closer to a polio-free world. Also, in appreciation for your time here today, we're going to present you with a Rotary mug, Rotary Connects the World. <laughs> so before we adjourn today, I just wanted to read one quick thing I picked up in Axios today which kind of meets number four of the four-way test, will it be beneficial for all concerned. <clears throat> the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation, uh, Bill is taking stock right now of 20 years that they worked uh, for the foundation. They spent $53.8 billion on global health and development. And here's a quote. 20 years later, we're just as optimistic and we're still swinging for the fences, but we now have a much deeper understanding of how important it is to ensure that innovation is distributed equitably. If only some people in some places are benefiting from new advances, then others are falling further behind. We believe that progress should benefit everyone, everywhere. So based on that, let's go out and do some good in the world this week. This meeting's adjourned. <laughs>